night's May 7th select board meeting. I'll call it meeting to order. First thing on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Is there any additions to the agenda or changes from anybody? The, the only thing I would add is I'll uh, provide you with an update on the uh, discussion with the state police and if we can put that in conjunction with the speed concerns item, that's probably as good a place as any. Okay. Uh, with that being said, if somebody make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? A second. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, second thing on the agenda is uh, the consent agenda items. Minutes of April 17th meeting and liquor licenses for the Grange Hall Cultural Center and the Best Western. I'll make the motion that we approve the consent agenda items as listed. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, public, is there anybody here from the public that wishes to speak at this time? Hands up. Alrighty. Okay. Uh, moving away on then. Uh, interviews for candidates. Martha Staskus for Planning Commission. You're in the hot seat first, Martha. I see you hiding back there. <laughs> Come right up here. So, didn't you uh, just get off the DRB? What made you decide to jump back in the fire again? <laughs> uh, I'd rather be on the planning side than on the um, issues side, if you will. <laughs> you got to return the favor, huh? <laughs> All right. Well, um, I don't know if any of the rest of the board members are familiar with Martha. She's how long were you on the DRB? It's quite some time, right? Back when it was the town zone, ZBA, so probably f three or four years on that. And then when did that change happen? I think it was 2010, something like that. Oh, my God. <laughs> we're, not, we're not trying to date you here at all, but <laughs> sounds like you've put you've invested some time here in in the, in uh, volunteering for the town's government. And uh, I think it's important to participate if you're going to be a community member. So okay, so um, do we need a nomination, or can we just? Uh, Prover for the position. Well, I mean, it, a motion should be made and okay. uh, seconded to uh, appoint Martha to the planning commission, and then at that point you should you can have a discussion with her if you want, or you can just call her to the home and approve her. <laughs> I would make a motion to appoint Martha Staskus for planning commission. I'll second that. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded. That would be for terminating. Wait a minute, I didn't know how long. <laughs> <laughs> For a three year term. April 30th. 2021. 21. Would you like to withdraw? <laughs> 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 OK, motion been made and seconded to um, appoint Martha Staskus for planning commission uh, for the, to the date of, uh, for the term of April 30th, 2021. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Hi. Thank Congratulations. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Martha. <laughs> I can go. Okay. Uh, second on the list of in interviews is a letter from Andrew 
Straninsky for Development Review Board. Is Andrew here? He's not able to come. He works in for the Underhill Planning Zoning on Mondays nights. Well, it's his job is on Monday nights, which is why he submitted a letter. Okay, and so I'm assuming there's a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, a date for that term as well? Uh, that is, Yes, April 30th, 2021. So if somebody would like to uh, make a motion to approve Andrew Strinsky. Can I, I don't know anything about this person. I sent your letter. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I guess I didn't read the letter. Apologize. So we can move more forward with a motion and have discussion if it's, if it's seconded, yes. So, so somebody would like to make that motion? I will um, move that we appoint Andrew Cernesti for the Development Review Board uh, with a term ending of April 2021. Second. I would second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Um, is there any further discussion? As far as uh, discussion, uh, right from my perspective, the, uh, the letter certainly outlined um, pretty impressive background and, and the fact that he's currently the planning director and zoning administrator in, uh, for the town of Underhill uh, certainly gives him uh, technical background uh, for working with the rest of our development review board. So I would be supportive of his nomination. He was here for the DIB meeting last week for the last 20 minutes or whatever it was on Wednesday night. As a citizen observer. <laughs> I would agree that he looks like he has a very good broad background. Yes. Specific as well, so I'd be supportive. Yep. All right, any other comments? Seeing none, a motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, it looks like we got a plate full of committee appointments tonight. Uh, Reappointments, Planning Commission, Ken Bellevue, for the term up to 2021, but. April 30th. Okay, they're all, they're all April 30th. Okay. Um, do we need to go down through each one separately, Bill, or can we lump them? I think you can make a motion to point everyone on the list. Okay, well, I'll go down through the list then. So, <laughs> Planning Commission for Ken Bellevue for April 30th, 2021. Uh, Development Review Board, Tom Kinley uh, for April 30th, 2021, and Dave Rogers that still April 30th? Yeah. yeah. They're okay. All, they're all well, April hers, his is 2020, so I didn't know if maybe the date was yeah. different. Okay. So they're all April 30th. Um, so the de Development Review Board, Tom Kinley, Dave Rogers, Recreation Committee, Bill Minter, Barbara Blavelt, Paul Lawson, all uh, April 30th, 2021. Conservation Commission, Nick Waringa. Ernie Hurley, both April 30th, 2022. Uh, Tree Committee, Steve Lasbeach, new appointment, uh, April 30th, 2019. That's, uh, I'm sorry, that's Tree Warden. Oh, okay, so. Committee. What'd you say, Tree Warden. Tree Warden, not Tree Committee. Oh, he's, he's Tree Committee also. Okay. He's on both, but, he, a new but he's a new tree warden. Yeah, he's a new limmer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, representative to Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Again, Steve Lostbeach, April 30th, 2019. Uh, representative to Mad River Resource 
Management Alliance, Alec Tuscany, uh, for 2019, his term. Alternate rep for Mad River Resource Management Alliance, Bill Woodruff. Representative to the Central Vermont Police Advisory Board, Mr. Mark Mater himself, 2020. An animal control officer. <laughs> And likes the punishment there. Zeb, <laughs> Zeb Town, uh, April 30th, 2019. So all those. Was that the Vermont Policy Advisory Board? <clears throat> it's the uh, State Police Community Advisory Board. Central Vermont Policy Advisory police. Board. Police. That's police. supposed to be police. That's what I said, wasn't it, originally? OK. So with all those committee appointments, uh, there would be a motion to uh, appoint those people for those terms. I'll make a motion to appoint um, all of the previously mentioned positions for their terms. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded to uh, approved all the aforementioned uh, names for specific uh, positions throughout the town's municipality for terms up to April 30th and dates coincide. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And I abstain. Okay, 720, we're 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Um, we're here to consider a uh, appointment to the Library Commission, Dan DeSanto, to introduce Susan Mazza. Uh, Dan. So just a few notes on the Library Commission in the library in general. This has been a time of transition, both um, on the commission and in the library. By this March, we will have entirely flipped our board in the course of two or three years, losing longtime commissioners like Harriet Grenier, Margaret Luce, and coming up this March, Alice Durkin. Uh, those three women probably have around a half century of experience on the commission between them. Uh, and that's a lot of institutional knowledge and experience that we're losing. But soon we'll also be losing our library director. Uh, Mary has given her notice that she'll be retiring this summer. And that's another 17 years of experience walking out the door. So it's a time of transition, but as the select board no doubt knows, times of transition can also be times of opportunity. Um, we've got new folks on the board representing different sections of the community different voices and opinions about the direction of the library, and that's all good. Um, we're positive about our community's library, and we hope to broaden the reach in the future and serve even more community members in different ways. Uh, and this brings me to Susan. So we're happy to put forth Susan Mazza for library commissioner. Susan is a library user and a supporter. She sees the value in library collections and programming. And she knows from experience that a good library can be an attraction for new families looking to move into a town. Her background is in banking and lending, having worked for the Chittenden Bank for many years, and also now for the US Small Business Association. And that's her experience there is a huge plus to our board. As of March, as I mentioned, we'll be losing our longtime treasurer, Alice Durkin. Um, so I speak for the rest of the commissioners and enthusiastically putting forth Susan Mazza um, that's our nomination for our next commissioner. Time for new blood, huh? <laughs> <laughs> How long is this term for? This term, uh, I believe, is till April 30th as well? No, she will be appointed until next town meeting. Next town meeting, and okay. And then you'll have to take out March. a petition in January to get on the ballot in March. And I, is this Roy Lloyd's term? Yeah. So I think it's a remaining one-year term. So just, just for everyone's information, the law says that if there's a vacancy in a, in a uh, elected uh, board, 
in a position on an elected board, the select board has the authority to appoint the person. The appointment is only made until the next town meeting where the appointee and anyone else can run for the unexpired term. So if, if Roy was supposed to have a term that ended in uh, town meeting day of 2020, the appointment that you make today will be good through next town meeting, and then if she desires so, Susan will have to be in a position to run, and anyone else can run at that same time. But you, you can't appoint somebody for the full term. Right, it's just until the next election. And, and who is who's the gentleman getting done? Roy Lloyd is oh, Roy. retired, uh, left the board quite a while ago. In fact, I think there was a vacancy at town meeting and nobody ran for it. Correct, yeah. And someone ran for, we had a five-year seat up, someone ran for that five-year seat. Right. So this is, this is the one that's open. So, Dan, just out of curiosity, is Roy still staying in Waterbury, do you know, or no. he isn't? I am. It's moved, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Susan, do, would you like to add anything, or? Um, I've been in the Waterbury area for many years, um, and uh, my background is in banking and finance and so forth. I actually was on the chamber board as a treasurer for a few years when I was working in the Mad River Valley. And, um, but I've also seen a lot of what some libraries can do with, with uh, programming for both youth and adults. And I'm really excited about what libraries can be to a community, um, especially given that the, the uh, facility you've got here, you have so much opportunity. It's really exciting. And um, I'm very involved in the small business community in terms of interacting in economic development and areas like that. So I get really excited when I see about what can be done. That's, I've off, actually often mentioned to Alice, Alice and I had worked with, together at the Chitton and many years ago, I've interacted with her and I've been friends with her for many years. I had mentioned to her my interest in the library many moons ago, actually. And so when she came to me, she goes, are you actually interested? It's like, yes, I always was. So it's, it's authentic for me. That's my mm -hmm. two cents. Well, just. So you know, I'll throw this out there. My life has never allowed me, well, I shouldn't say never allowed me, but my path has never taken me in, in the direction of anything to do with the library. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I can honestly tell you, I, you know, recalling the old library that was here uh, in the condition it was in and the desire to upgrade um, you know, for people like me that never, never experienced anything to do with libraries, uh, couldn't ever see the reasoning behind it. But I can honestly say that since the new library has come about, um, to some degree, I've seen the activity that's taken place there and have been quite impressed. Um, so it's amazing to think that uh, the amount of people that do spend time at the library as opposed to, I mean, they could be doing a lot worse, I guess. <laughs> so it's, uh, I'm glad to see you coming on board and I hope you enjoy uh, the term that you're here and maybe you'll be successful with the next one if you so choose to. So um, is there any other comments from any of the rest of the board? No, I'll, uh, I'll make the motion that we appoint Susan Mazza uh, to the vacant library commission position uh, pending the election at town meeting. Okay. I'll second that. All right, no further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Now we're on to a different subject. Uh, how about some, uh, maybe too many fast cars there on Guptal Road. Um, <laughs> uh, Kyra? Kira. Kira. Yeah, okay. 
Voilà. Chris, will you get the one Oh. Yes. So I brought a few people with me. Is this yours? This is not my son. Okay. Did this, you? I'm Alex. Alex. Say your full name, Alex. Alexander McCabe. McCabe. And he lives on Guptill Road as well. All right. And so he just wanted to add his own. Do you want to start? Well, Who's the other yeah, yeah. So. Um, and how formal do you want to be? I'm used to testifying up at the state house, so how formal oh, do you want? <laughs> because I can get really formal and just be like, hi, it's so nice to meet you all. <laughs> um, so we'll go with informal, and then if you want uh, more formal, just let me know. So my name is Kira Cryer, and I live in uh, on Guptill Road on Henrietta Guyatt's uh, old house uh, with Heath Dolly and my two children, uh, Maisie Whalen and Jonah Whalen. Um, so I feel like when Just introduce yourself. I'm um, Alexander McCabe again, and you have a sister, and I have a sister named Hazel, and what's her mom? Three year olds, and my mom's name is Jen, also Jennifer, um, McCabe. McCabe, and I love them both very much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Andrea Andrews. I live on um, Upper Couple Road as well, Upper House. And then we have two other supporters who are in the back. So I'm Kelly Massacott. This is my partner, Mike Bailey. And until last year, we lived on Guptill Road for 14 years. Right across from Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right next to yeah. Okay. You're the gentleman with the Whit Whitcomb truck, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, Alex, is that where you live now? No. He lives a couple houses up, closer to the center. Like, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, go ahead. Um, Speeding has been a big problem on our road, especially when me and my friends are biking home in the triangle where I live. We'll see cars going by maybe 50, 60 miles an hour on a 25 mile an hour speed limit. And it's honestly scary because they could swerve and hit any one of us at any second. And we try to be as careful as we can, but we can only be so careful. Um, so, um, also, Oh, like down on the hill, I feel like people take advantage of the hill and don't use their brakes when they should be using their brakes and they go way too fast. Last year when I was biking home after and during school vacation, um, actually a street race happened as I was biking home and I nearly got hit. And that was probably the scariest moment of my life for me. So that, that's sort of why we're here and why I reached out to you all is um, over school break, some, with the April break. Um, it's been an ongoing issue. I think that's why we, um, and we had called the state police last spring and had the speed trap set up and they, they patrolled for a little bit and it was great. Um, you know, the speed trap thing is Sometimes that makes people go faster. Like at night, you could hear them, you know, really try to make that thing go. And then there's, you know, other things that it helps them slow down. Um, and we've tried as community members to really, um, for a long time, Mike would just stand out there and scream, slow down. I'm a crazy lady. Yeah, and Andrew has done that, and Heath has done that. Um, but over school break, it just got to a point where it got really scary. And for um, not just this incident that he just spoke about, but there was some playing that was happening, and my son disappeared for a little bit into the woods, but we actually were checking the ditches first. And that's when it became really apparent to me that that's how scared I am of the traffic. That my first response was looking for his sweatshirt in the ditches, because we couldn't find where he was. And so we have a couple proposals. I know, um, and, I, and I'm willing to hear the pushback on those proposals because I know they're money. Um, but the concern for it, we have, we have eight children who live on that stretch. And from what I understand, um, it's always been filled with family members in the stretch that we're in. Um, but these kids are running, you know, they're crossing the street. It's the best neighborhood. It's so loving and welcoming, and they're all playing, bouncing from one house. It's the perfect Vermont life. And then we got scared. You know, we got scared from these, um, from these scary incidences where we think, where we're yelling at people or 
people aren't mindful. There's distracted driving now. You know, this isn't. This is different than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Distracted driving is happening, and they're not paying attention and speeding. And I, we're just really concerned at this point as a community of where is the safety of for our children. And do you want to add to that? Well, yeah. I mean, increase increased cars, increased development, yeah. increase. I mean, it's all increasing. We all know that. So you know. There's more cars going by. And, you know, it's 25 there, and I understand, I, you know, we're all guilty of not going 25 <laughs> there. But it gets to the top of the hill next to the town shed where, you know, people are going 50. I had a girlfriend at one point go and say, all right, go drive 25, I want to see what that looks like. Go drive 30, I want to see what that looks like. And I had her go back and forth yeah. until she hit 50 or 60. And it's scary. Like, I am that crazy lady that'll be screaming at somebody to slow down. You know, um, we'll be at the bus stop. And so here it is morning commute, and there's all these kids out there waiting for buses, and the cars are flying by us. Like, I get they're busy. I am also concerned that, you know, it's possible that the light at the end of Guptal is just going to add more traffic because it's going to be easier for people to get in and out of that now. So it's just going to add more cars, and they're all going fast. I mean, everyone wants to get home, everyone wants to work on time. I get it, but I want to let my 10 and 7 year old go to Hope Davy without putting their life in their hands. You know, I mean, we go to the backwoods and go that way as well, but, you know, we have this little guptal gang of kids that like to hang out, and we're trying to let them all have some independence, and, you know, we don't want to worry that they're on their cell phones, you know, it's just worse than it ever was, so, you know, we would like to put, propose maybe a couple speed bumps or humps, you know, at, just at the end of guptal where it's supposed to be 25, where everyone needs to slow down, and just realize that all these houses are close to the road, there's kids everywhere playing. It's a little village, you know, and um, just a reminder that everyone needs to slow down. I think everyone's guilty of it. I am too. But now that I have kids that are ready to go off and bike on their own and play at other kids' houses and not have to call every second, you know, I'd, I'd like to know they're, they're safe, as can be. So the, uh, I have a couple reasonable requests, and then I have like the higher end in terms of finance <laughs> requests. <laughs> so the reasonable request that could happen tomorrow is children at play signs, um, a slow down. Even in Burlington, in one community, they have one of those flashing signs that says, you know, when you're speeding, it starts flashing really crazy and says, you know, the mileage. And that that's one that also I feel like is a little bit affordable than the other ones I'm going to ask for we're going to ask for but there's no children at play entering our entering no. the village there's no like park like the park is right there there's no sign suggesting that kids are even there's people who run on that road i mean bike the, the frisbee golf people are walking the road i mean there's just so much activity there which is amazing that even just posting that you're coming into a, you know, a community where there's people walking. And there's no sidewalk. There's no sidewalk. There's no side, there's no there's no side of the road. You know, it's either a ditch Gravel. or a road. Yeah. It's like a <laughs> so that would be my first suggestion that could be done tomorrow. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the other is speed bumps, which I had spoken um, briefly through email communication about what that would look like during that stretch. Uh, and so um, the guy that's behind us said, well, that, you know, that hurts the snow plows or there's some sort of like reason why that can't be. Uh, so my initial pushback on Randy with that was like, well, a kid dead is really worse than a snow plow being damaged. And I think that if we had done it on Randall, that we could do it here. But I understand that and pushback. Butler. And Butler. So, uh, right, they've done it on those two roads. Why not this stretch? Because there's a park. Everybody is riding that way. Um, and now, especially because of the mountain bike trails. Then, if you, my next suggestion, which is even larger money, is installing stop signs. So if you put a stop sign where that Maple Howard is, if you can put a stop sign so that people have to stop, and actually decide whether they're going to go on Maple or go to Howard, that might slow down too, because you could have a sign saying stop sign approaching and then people naturally slow down. But from the town garage through to Maple, people are driving 65 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, uh, on, with not even thinking about it. So um, we're really at it. It's sort of, I feel like at this point I've gotten to like, Please help us before something tragic happens. I don't want that to be part of our community. Um, 
And so I'm willing to hear if anybody has any thoughts. Is your concern? Oh, go ahead. Well, I just want to add to what Kira said. Um, we've lived there for 14 years. That microphone might not be on. Oh, There's a button right on the top. I usually talk loud enough, but. <laughs> it's for the camera. Is that better? Yeah, hopefully. Um, so we lived there for 14 years, uh, right uh, on the edge of Woodard uh, Drive and Guptill Road. And we did not raise children there, but we walked our dog religiously twice a day. I would wear Mike's reflectorized vest, you know, even it, sometimes at daylight and a headlamp. And um, I felt very unsafe. And we were walking on that road a lot. And over those 14 years, we definitely saw more and more pedestrians using it, which is wonderful. I raised the concern when the development was approved to go across the street there. There's going to be even more people walking. We need sidewalks and, uh, on Guptill Road. It's just dangerous. I mean, our old house sits very close to the road, and people, understandably, would walk right on the front lawn very close to the house because of the traffic going very fast. And I do think it was one of the reasons, frankly, we did move from Guptill Road is it was just, un it felt unsafe for us for walking our dog, for visitors with small children, just regular people walking. And so I do strongly urge you to do something there. Um, the traffic actually on Columbus Day weekend two years ago, because Route 100 was so backed up, all of the traffic apps like Google Maps and um, the iPhone app was giving people the Guptill Road as the way to go through town. So we were even getting a lot of out-of-state cars at times. And I just think the amount of traffic, certainly foot traffic, has substantially increased over the last, from what I know, 14, 15 years. So I just reiterate what they said and urge something to be done there. <clears throat> Board. Did you want to say something, Bill? Yes. <laughs> hey, Ann. The dead horse here. Uh, my name is Bill Minter. I live on <laughs> Gumbel Road. Uh, and um, my wife asked me to stop in and mention that um, since construction has begun, we've seen a lot more traffic and high-speed traffic and um, I'm sorry I wasn't here earlier if there was discussion of uh, speed bumps or other traffic control devices but um, definitely notice a significant difference and, and heightened concerns. I had a question. I was going to say the board had um, to say. It will it seemed like the focus from what you were speaking about was your familiarity also with the area near where you live, um, maybe from the town garage up to the center green. Yeah. Is that Hope Davy. To, to Hope, Hope, Davy, to Hope Davy. Um, Is that what your concern is mostly and not all of Guptill Road or more? You think it's worse in that area? I think, I mean, I think all of Guptill Road, what's what is different in our section is most of our houses are on the road. So, which is different, you know, a little bit down farther, they're set off the road a little bit, so maybe it's not as much of a concern. Um, but I don't know how they feel. I mean, I know that I've talked with the Brenniers during farm season and they think it's a problem too, but, um, you know, I don't know how it affects them because they're in a little bit. So, I'm just speaking from what I've noticed uh, in our tight community there. And like she said, from the great, from the town shed at this point to just where it turns up Maple, there's eight children just yeah. there. You know, and I know that there's children that live up Maple that would love to bite down and hang out and go baby with our kids. And you know, their parents are just thinking, well, I'd love to let them go, but I'm afraid of all the cars. cars. You know, going it, it's also the speed limit there. Yeah, it's 25 <laughs> compared right. to other parts of the Yeah, yeah. Right, so you hit right. 25 right there at the town. At the town. town yeah. yeah, it's 30 down at Grand Years. No one, you know, again, people don't usually slow down. I mean, we drive it all day after. Yeah, and, and then from Grand Years, four, like towards the stop sign, towards 100 is 40. So it's 40, then 35, and then at the top of the hill turns 25. Yeah. 30, I think. Um, <clears throat> what I just passed out to the board, uh, <clears throat> and this is. Timely, it's just coincidental, but <laughs> about, I want to say three years ago, um, in a response to some other concerns about Guptill Road, 
uh, the select board asked the state agency of transportation to uh, look at Guptill Road. Uh, there's a program called, um, it's kind of an interesting way that they put it, High Risk Rural, high risk rural Road Program. And um, so it was 2015 when we spoke to the state about this. And just last week on Friday, uh, these design plans that I just passed out came in. We also have one for Stowe Street as well. And um, there's a contract asking the town whether we'll enter into this agreement. And the long and short of it is, if the town enters into this agreement, we've already told them that we were gonna do it. Uh, it's a little bit surprising it took three years, but all good things take time, I guess. <laughs> um, so the state uh, has uh, done traffic studies and studies of the of the road geometry, the driveway accesses into the into the street uh, all along the route from Route 100 all the way to the center. Mm -hmm. So these signs, uh, you know, there's uh, narrow bridge signs, there's curb signs, there's uh, school bus signs with you know flashers on them indicating there's children. Um, Children at play signs are not signs that are uh, allowed by the um, uh, the, um, MUTC. the MUTC standards. I was oh. trying to remember what that means right now. It's all the Manual of Uniform Traffic right. Control Devices. Um, <laughs> you tell I work at Petrie. So they, they, they put up they put signs up that you know have uh, pictures on them now. Um, so anyway, the state is. Ready to move forward. I don't, if we sign this agreement, I don't know if they're going to do it next week or I talked to Bill Woodruff uh, on Friday when he gave me this. He said it could be as late as 2019. But to get all these signs updated, uh, the state will pay for the signs, pay for the installation of the signs, and the town's responsibility is to then maintain the signs going forward. Um, just so you folks know, uh, 25 is the lowest speed limit that the state allows a municipality to set on any road. Um, uh, we have a traffic ordinance on the agenda for later tonight. There's no proposals right now to change any of the speed limits on Guptill Road. Um, I think that, and I travel the Guptill Road from uh, Neyland Flats back and forth at least a couple of times every day. Um, I think the speed limits are fine. Uh, it's that there's no enforcement of the speed limits. And again, in a little bit after this discussion, Mark Mateo, one of the select board members, is going to uh, update us. Uh, the town intends to contract with the state police beginning on July 1st for 80 hours of dedicated coverage in Waterbury. And one of the things that we'll do when that contract is ready to start is to point out areas of particular concern to us. And it doesn't mean the state police are going to be there every single day or every single hour, but we'll talk to them about it. Um, there is no stop sign at when you're going up Guptill Road when you get to the intersection of Howard Ave and the Y of Maple Street. Um, I don't know if, the, I don't think there's any reason why the board could not decide to put a stop sign there going up. Uh, if you think that would help, it certainly would make traffic stop before they accelerated up Maple Street to uh, Hope Davy Park or go across as if they were going to Route 100. Uh, it's not in the ordinance now, but since you're talking about the ordinance today, if you wanted to add it, it's just you could you could add that stop sign, add it to the ordinance, and have it be effective when the ordinance becomes effective. So does it always have to be an intersection? Could it be the town garage entrance? Yeah, you 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 really can't um, on a thoroughfare. You, you know, I I don't think it's common practice to just put a stop sign kind of where there's no intersection in a, 
the stop sign, if you were going to put one there, would be the stop sign stopping the traffic coming out of the town garage. You wouldn't be able to put a stop sign on the street just in the middle of the long run. At least I, I don't see that happen, and I think it would be a, a little bit of a cause for concern. And then can you put a sign that says stop sign ahead so that people yep. know to slow down? Okay. And it's just a clarifying question about the signs, mm -hmm. if you can't do children at play or park ahead, um, is there, like, can you do slow? <laughs> like those yellow signs they Were you saying there is one with just pictures of kids? Well, they've got a picture. They, I don't see one in here. And I don't know. I think this stops at the intersection that we just described. I'm not sure it goes all the way up past Hope Davy. Looks like it's the intersection where the maple shoots out there, and that's it. At the Y, right? Yeah. Going up where you yeah. go. Page 11. Page 10. Nine. See, nine goes Maple Street. That's a nine. Right. <coughs> so Town Garage, and then uh, there'd be a stop. Because there's even our, our, the bus stop isn't located on Maybe they are either. putting a stop. So it looks like they, they are putting like a stop. There they're going to put a stop sign there. Um, well, those, yeah. There already is a stop. Yeah. yeah. That's for already based on coming from. Oh, that's Maple coming Street. from Maple Street. Maple Street. Yeah, we well, what you're talking about is one in that dip. Yes. And had people stop on yes. that for grade. Mm -hmm. no. But there's no road intersection there. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe. Maple Street. It goes yeah. like this. That yeah. Y. Where you, yeah. where yeah. you could put a stop sign where that number 86 slash four is. I think going up. Is that a three-way stop there? Then? Yes. Uh, well, it's kind of two-way, because Maple Street traffic coming off has to stop, and this would be, uh, or, or are you talking both sides of that intersection? Both sides of that intersection. So, so then you, you stop at the four corners, and then you stop again, and then you, yeah. So you'd We can talk about, I mean, I'm supportive of that, of having a stop sign on the east side of that triangle, yeah. center green. As we talk, I'd just like to understand some of the other options. Is there a 25 mile an hour speed bump? Does that exist? Is that something that? 25 Meaning a yes, speed bump you can go over go 25. at 25 yeah. miles an hour. Costa Rica is full of so less than 25. Mexico, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they exist in town on Butler Street and Randall. Yeah, because they're, they're, not, they're not huge, yeah. like hurt your car. They are just slow down, huh? yeah. I feel like, on Butler. And, um, you know, yeah, I, you know, the <laughs> speed bumps, uh, we have a, a couple on Randall Street and on Butler Street. Typically, they're used in, you know, in those kind of residential settings, not on class two <laughs> roads like mm -hmm. this is. Um, certainly, I think they might be more appropriate in the triangle area. I don't think on Guptal Road, you know, when you're coming down the hill and all the way out to Guptal Road, I don't think there would be appropriate on the areas where we have 40 mile an hour speed limits. Um, you know, the highway, they are inconvenient for people yeah. in yeah. The, the trucks. And, uh, you know, it's not that they are unconcerned, but, you know, they're, they're a little bit problematic. Um, I guess what I'd like to do with this is have the select board authorize me to sign the agreement with the state to do this. I've got another one for Stowe Street that's incorporated into the same, uh, the same contract. Um, we can ask about the, you can include in the ordinance in a, in a little while the stop signs at the intersection of Maple Street and Guptill Road. And then as far as the speed bumps are concerned, I'd like to take that under advisement, talk to the public works director, the highway foreman, and we can revisit that issue at, a, at another meeting. I don't want to commit to it and say it's not a problem. I'd like to have the whole thing kind of looked at a little bit and come back and talk about that. I think um, um, the, the wider speed table is probably not what would be 
something for Bill to look at. Yeah, we have speed Not tables on Randall Street. A little more right. user-friendly. User Slow them down enough so they're not going 50. Right there. But, um, so I'd imagine the traffic's going to increase heavily this summer as well as the yeah. construction gets into that zone, too. That's what's scaring me heavily yeah. this summer. So, yeah. Right, that's... And the baseball season is, I mean, they're, they're running back. You, it's beautiful up there. There's skate parks there. That's where I pulled him from this afternoon. Um, and my son's playing baseball up there right now. Like, there's, you know, they're all running around and enjoying the beauty. And it just, I am really happy that you guys were already thinking about this and adding the stop sign. I'm still stuck on flashing lights. I just want to say yeah. that. Of like, <laughs> don't go out there. Um, uh, and just because it's so worrisome to me of how fast people are going. If there's any, if it can't be not allowed because it's happening in Burlington. So, there's a well, flash lights. You mean like the one on Stowe Street? Yeah, the st sign on Stowe Street has been, I think, pretty effective. Yeah, I think it's very yeah. effective. Yeah. yeah. What does, what's the cost for something like that? A couple thousand dollars. So I want to let you know that uh, under con understand your concerns. Um, it's been a long time that I've been a witness to things that have changed on Guptill Road. Uh, there used to be a donut shop just up around the corner that I used to ride my bike to when I was his age. Uh, that was many moons ago. Um, I think uh, a couple of things are at, at play here uh, with this issue. Just to let you know, three days ago, I actually called the state police. Um, I was coming down by uh, used to be Joe Gillette's log cabin there, just past Harold McNulty's, and uh, approaching uh, the Nealon Flats Guptill Road intersection, and I witnessed this little black Toyota uh, sedan come down off uh, Nealon Flats, doing in excess of 60 miles an hour, and he never touched his brakes, and was almost on two wheels, turning the corner, and pretty near T-boned another vehicle. Um, I actually, uh, had to accelerate to get to the back of his car to get his plate number, but I was successful in doing it and uh, called the state police. Now, I don't know whatever happened with it, but uh, I live just down around the corner there um, behind the Zen, or before the Zen bar, and uh, trust me, I witness a lot of what goes on and on that drag. Uh, I'm mean, as concerned as you are, and uh, I just keep thinking to myself, Keep up with your annex, people, because it's going to end here shortly uh, when the state police get on board. Hopefully, we're going to uh, fill our coffers with a revenue source here in short order um, <clears throat> and start to sting people in the butt. Um, so having said that, um, before I think bef the board needs to consider that in play as part of this, hopefully, this remedy uh, and whether or not we can uh, maybe postpone some of these bigger issues, uh, costly issues, and see if uh, the impact of having the state police uh, with speed control, um, how that works. Uh, and I understand the, you know, the timing issue that you want to have this dealt with as soon as possible. Um, but maybe there's a chance that uh, some of this will uh, become under control uh, once the state police are on board full time. Um, and if not, well, and maybe we can, we can get a better sense of uh, what needs to be done in, in conjunction with them uh, to uh, hopefully bring some of this speeding to an end. Um, the four-way intersection right there by um, Howard Ave, um, the, the uh, hollow dip and uh, Guptill Road, I've seen people blow through that thing time and time again. I always, it's a four-way stop as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it is a four-way But not for everybody. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, and, but not for everybody. So even, even signs sometimes don't uh, make a difference. Uh, people got to get sting in the, stung in the wallet before, it, uh, before they pay attention. Um, 
Can I give you some pushback on that? Sure. <laughs> That's what you're here for. <laughs> um, my pushback on that is you can't have a police officer there all Saturday and Sunday when the kids are um, in full swing up there. Um, and so although I appreciate that, we've called ourselves. They've been up there. We had the trap in our yard, actually. I don't know if anybody <laughs> thought of it. We, we had it, um, you know, like stuck to our front porch even. So. Um, so we've already attempted that uh, before approaching you. Uh, okay, if we have, I understand they're coming on to, and they'll actually get maybe more money from us from coming up there, but um, that's only a temporary fix and they're only there at certain times. And that's my, that's my big pushback for you. Um, the kids are there all the time, not just when the police are there. Yeah, and the other, the other problem that we're faced with right now, and I can tell you that it's, it's true for a fact, is that people are jump, jumping off 100. Yeah. And racing like hell to get up around and get back on over by the cider right. mill before right. they beat the line of traffic that's being held up from 100 being yeah. such drastic shape. So right. I know and that that's an also, also a big part of this problem right, right now. And that's in the morning time. So And Alexander walks from that intersection that we're talking about to Woodard Lane for the bus stop. And my kids walk from right there too. So there's no sidewalk, there's no slowdown. That's why another con just concern coming into this season. I am. Okay. Bill? Uh, I, again, I want to apologize if by getting here a little late I missed or I repeat. <laughs> but just to give uh, certainly some um, historical perspective, um, and to push back a little bit about the sense that the speed limits are now corrected, um, that, that that 25 mile an hour um, speed limit um, came about through a similar process. Um, and the exact locations of the families and the kids was a little bit different. Um, it was much more concerned about that rising up that hill and you get to near the post office, you can't see people coming in and out and going across, and the same thing with the um, town shed there and the ambulance farm. And so then that's when that speed limit got lowered. Um, and so I would just say that to say that uh, other parts of the road that are now 40 miles per hour, it's fine to be 40 miles per hour there. I'm not sure I would really agree with that. And I think the long-term future that we're looking for for Gulfport Road is, as a number of other places, just a you know significant increase in bike and pedestrian friendliness and support, and the area that we're talking about right now, right now is the congested area, and it is you know logical because of the assets that are there in terms of park, etc. Um, but to expect people to be okay with 40 miles an hour buzzing by your driveway and a bunch of others, and I don't know how many kids will be living there soon, and then to slow down as they come up the hill. Um, we're really happy that that 25 is there, but I'm not sure that um, 40 miles an hour is appropriate at other people's drivers. The rest of the board have anything to say? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I, I'm personally in support of budgeting and figuring out how to afford at least one, if not two, speed signs that flash over whatever speed it typically is. The speed limit itself, like we put on Stowe Street, if we were only able to agree on one, would it be coming from Sun Barn towards? Mm -hmm. Yes. I would imagine yes. that seems to be the more problematic direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I would hope that the board would support the investment in a sign like that. I think a couple thousand dollars to protect some of the safety of the children in this area is worth it. And I don't think. I personally don't need to wait on that decision, so I'm in support of that. So is that just a one-time cost bill, or is there a, like a yearly fee on something like that as well? Or um, well, would it, the the ongoing cost would be the electricity or paying a higher price to have a solar panel to provide the power to the sign. Um, I don't remember. It might be a little bit higher than 2,000. Certainly, um, it's less than five. But uh, I don't remember offhand what the cost of the one. We put two on Stowe Street. And those are wired. One is connected to the power grid, and the other, I believe, the downhill one has a uh, solar panel on it. The solar panel one is more expensive. Well, 
Um, I would like to suggest that maybe a couple of the board members and perhaps uh, Woody uh, do a little field trip exclusion of this. We have a number of options being proposed here, and any number of them are, are fine, but well, what is going to be the best one for that? Simply throwing a sign up someplace and then expecting that that's going to resolve the issue. I, I really would be interested in seeing what we may be able to do for uh, traffic calming coming into that whole area. And if, you know, really you're, you're looking at um, probably the other side of the fire station down to the, uh, the town shed, mm -hmm. that, that general area, as well as coming up Howard, because um, yep. uh, the, the same thing happens from that angle. So if, if we can take a generalized look at it, um, see what this sign package uh, involves, and then if, if additional signage makes sense, that's fine. If uh, some other traffic calming measure is appropriate, the, uh, the speed bumps or speed tables, um, there are pluses and minuses with them, but they, they certainly are effective and may be a, uh, a more effective route to go, but we need to balance that a little bit. But I, I would not be opposed to meeting up in the next week or so and, and trying to get a handle handle on that, it seems to make sense. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. Can you pass I, those? I also want to add that uh, I actually lived on Stowe Street for eight years and saw the effectiveness of the flashing sign, and now I live on Ring Road and drive on Guptill almost every day to Stowe. So I know this very area very well, and I find myself sometimes caught off guard by the quick reduction in speed. Um, Sorry if I yell at you. No, it's fine. I, I hopefully I'm not the one doing that kind of speed through there, and I'm I'm, I'm pretty well, light, sure I'm not. The one catches your attention. Um, yeah. I just I I know that road very well. I I travel it multiple times every day, and I mean I I just think that we can go do that, but I I just don't I don't really agree that we need to spend a lot more time talking through this. I think there's a couple specific issues on certain roads, and this one obviously is a major concern for uh, the safety of some residents. Um, I think the combination of the police coming on and now policing an area that really had forever has not been policed is gonna be a really good thing, but I think in conjunction with um, a flashing sign again, I'll, I'm gonna support that tonight, so. I'll leave it at hey, that. I'm supportive of a flashing sign as well. I think it's been dramatic improvement on Stowe Street in terms of awareness and, um, you know, and I think it's, we had to do another study, but in terms of we had a similar group of, you know, parents come and children maybe two years ago, I don't remember, a year and a half ago, and um, responded by putting the signs out there and it's been effective. So I think it's a, it's an easy thing to do. It, yes, it costs money, but it's a low cost given, I think, the potential improvement. And I think Bill's point about pedestrian area as well as the comments that were made here, um, just the idea that um, more people are biking and walking in this area. And I mean, 25 years ago, there was a, a Green Pass of Waterbury grant that explored a separate walking path that uh, never went through because there were a couple of uh, homeowners that weren't quite on board, but there was, that was an idea 25 years ago, so here we are now. So I'm a supportive of the sign. I'm also supportive of the idea of looking in the big picture with the traffic coming. Can I just say one more thing? Oh. So first of all, I really appreciate this. is really great news. <laughs> it you makes have me... to go to the oh. I can't you well. Oh, you want to go over there? Yeah. Speak louder. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. This is really great. It's good news. Um, the only thing that I just want to point out is that Butler and Stowe Street do have sidewalks, and we don't. So I, I, I'm so grateful for the flashing sign, and more signs and police presence will be um, wonderful. But I do want to move forward with a hopeful of a speed table or a speed bump, just because we don't have. I mean, I think it'd be really expensive to try to put, you know, some sidewalks where we are, mm -hmm. but. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Thanks. Anyway, I would I would support Mark's suggestion of a subcommittee that works with Bill, and I'd be happy to participate in that because I live in the area. 
Okay. Well, we'll uh, kind of address, I think, uh, more detailed uh, so outline of this at the traffic ordinance uh, conversation, right, Bill? As far as well, how we're we can us. we can talk about a couple things with the traffic ordinance stop signs in particular. There's really nothing else that you can do now uh, with that. So your suggestion to meet with the public works director, um, are, are you wanting to hold up on this um, contract with the state to do this signage? Um, or uh, no, can I, we, I would, can we I would go say, ahead with that project? I would say go ahead with I mean, those. I can't, like I said, it could be as late as next year before yeah. they get to it. But yeah. the quicker we sign it, the quicker yeah. opportunity they no, have. I, to I think the signage uh, package that I was seeing on both of those, and uh, I'm just speaking for myself here, I thought uh, those would be a good, good enhancement. And like you say, it, it could take uh, uh, a year or so for that to actually go into effect, I see no reason to delay that. Um, we, if we do end up adding some additional ones that um, would, would be an expense that would, would be on our dime, but uh, uh, the packages presented for both Stowe Street and Guptal Road seem to be uh, very appropriate. Okay. All right. Bill, do you have, I have one other quick question. Uh, if we were to approve a flashing sign tonight, if I were to propose that, uh, what's the estimated lead time, if you had a best guess, from an couple approval months, to probably. months? A couple okay. months, yeah. Compared to maybe more than a year. Well, these sign packages here right. uh, is what Bill was talking about. Uh, it, it may happen more quickly. It may be more protracted. It, you started in, what, 2015? Right. with the discussion on this. So that's that's state speed. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully we can move much more promptly than that. So just to avoid down the road controversy, on the Guptal Road one, would y'all look at page 12? Um, there's two signs, one in each direction, to warn of the curve at, at the Zen Barn. Yep. And those signs are gonna, you know, that's Guptal's house there, and then uh, Austin's house, the, Austin's house at the top and Guptal's house at the bottom. Is that accurate in size? Well, pretty accurate. We've, they, they recommend, I don't remember offhand what the size of those signs are, but um, when we first looked at them, uh, Bill Woodruff asked, can we make them smaller? And they said that they would, but there is, the signs that will go up are as small as they're able to be. So I just, you know, if you don't like these signs, I don't know if the... The only other alternative would be those small multiple arrows, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, the one that's five, like four feet by the other one was six feet high. Look at the side of the building. Yeah. I, I think that the, the upper one is more to... I think the upper one is more to scale. Um, but they're going to be big signs. And one thing that I'm going to... I didn't think to ask Bill on Friday. He mentioned this to me. Then I looked at it and I said, we better go and talk to those property owners about <laughs> I, what it's going to look like. I just so. stated there, I wouldn't, I'm glad I'm not living there, but uh, um, yeah, you're right. That was, I was going to suggest you better go talk to the, the adjacent neighbors there first before you attempt yeah. to do something like that. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many people drove down Neyland Flats there or Guptal Road just the other day and saw the parking area down over the bank across from my place, that vehicle that was... Yes. Yes. Uh, um, I think we can look at the. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of wondering if uh, signs like this really make a difference when it comes if we, to. If we go to the sign like summary that. sheet, is it the one direction large arrow? It says that it's 18 inches wide and one foot tall. There's the whole summary. I mean, if, I'm wondering if that's the one. It says one direction large arrow, one direction large arrow. Maybe. It seems like they're in order of how they're on the road. Let me see if it. it that might be it. I didn't look at those, Mark. It may be it. Yeah. So those are significantly is, smaller, I think, than the picture. Is that aware? If it's 18 by 12, that isn't too bad. Yep. I think I think that's what's represented here. All right. Well, we'll check into it, and if they're if they're going to be excessively big, we'll make sure we talk to them. 
neighbors. Okay, so what I meant earlier was uh, as far as structuring, uh, I guess, our steps as how we would approach dealing with this, wouldn't that, would we lay that out now or wait till we get to the traffic ordinance portion of it? Well, I, I don't think there's anything to, to really lay out right now. I mean, well, there was uh, a suggestion. Mark and, Mark and, and uh, Jane have expressed support for a sign. If they want to put a sign up, they should make a motion and you should vote on that. I'll make that motion. Just time. Yeah, I would do it now. I'll make the motion to add a flashing speed sign similar to what we have on Stowe Street on the, I guess, uh, northbound direction on Guptill Road prior to, or when the 25 mile an hour zone starts prior to the town garage, ish. <laughs> okay, I know there's a second somewhere here. I'll second that. Uh, any further discussion? I mean, I don't know whether we need two signs or one. Let's start out with one. <laughs> so um, my question, I guess, would be um, to the board <coughs> and to Bill. It, um, would there would there be a uh, sunset on the time frame for this if at some point we felt it that traffic was under control and there was no longer a need for that? What do we well, own those signs yeah, once we, we buy them? Okay, yeah, we do. I mean, if you if you go to the if you go to the extent to buy the sign and install it, it would be foolish to take it out. You know, um, you know the. It's not in the, the money isn't in the budget for this sign. Uh, but when we did Stowe Street, the money wasn't in the budget for that sign either. And, you know, we have a budget that's well over a million dollars in the highway department. We can probably figure out a way to buy it if you want to do it. But it, it's not specifically budgeted. Um, what I'd like to do, I don't know, uh, there is, um, on the Stowe Street one, uh, there's uh, there's a they're going to remove the school flashing sign and they're going to put in a different sign and I believe there's going to be uh, you know a sign like this which shows children walking which probably we could put up on mm -hmm. uh, the Guptill Road and this has beacons on it. It's not a speed limit. It doesn't flash at you and say, you know, speed limit's 25 and you're going 42. It's a sign that blinks to alert you that there may be children present. present. Um, Is that you know, if, if we're going to, when we get to the uh, traffic ordinance, if you decide to include stop signs at the Maple Street, mm -hmm. uh, Guptill Road intersection that aren't in this plan now, We'll take them to the state to see if we can include them in the package. I don't know if the state would pay for the flashing speed limit signs. We can ask. Um, but I guess that's my point for, for waiting to make any of these motions or any of these decisions until we get to the traffic ordinance and then figure out how to structure moving forward with this as to effect of uh, you know, what should come first, whether we should go to do what you suggested. We've had members of the rec committee sitting here since September. Right, so I'm trying to move right. forward here. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and just try to figure out at that point, when we, when we talk about the traffic ordinance, how to structure any of these mm -hmm. uh, motions. Or, so we've made, got a motion that's been seconded how do we you can take if you that. want to push it off no just till we get to the tra tra traffic ordinance then pick okay. it back up again okay and you understand jane because there's a lot more in, involved in this than just this flashing sign that you're talking about and i just want to make sure that we have it in the right order is the order <laughs> it's the order just the question on whether or not the state would be paying for it or we're paying for it I guess I'll make the motion that we included in the traffic ordinance and if the state says they're not going to pay for it I'm making the motion that the town pays for it I guess what I'm afraid of is piling on too many uh, added here without making the ok 
Okay. Right. I guess I think that um, this seems like a safety issue that I don't think we can wait a year or a year and a half to address now that it's been brought up. And I think there seems to be a lot of support for this sign. So I'm hoping that we can but agree to, that maybe we can ask about whether it can be paid. And if it can't, that as, as Mark says, the town should pay for it, find a, find a way to pay for it. Okay, I'm not asking to deny any of that at this point. I'm just asking to take this question and put it off the traffic ordinance so we can get to Winterfest and these other issues and then address all of this under the traffic ordinance topic so that we get it in the right order. That's all I'm asking. Doesn't sound so, I'll just move forward then. Um, motion's been made and seconded to uh, authorize to purchase a flashing speed light, speed limit light uh, for somewhere on... Uh, it's at the 1.65 mi uh, mile sign from the intersection okay. of Guptal on 100. It's marked 1.65. It's the first 25 mile an hour sign prior to the truck entry at 1.705. So the transition point from the 30 to the 25. Correct. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for coming in. If you want us to be on that further conversation, just let us know. All righty. Thank you all for coming in. Recreation, Winterfest. <coughs> that you, Deb, Bill, who was that? Where Frank? Right, right up here, Frank. Uh, by myself. Let's <laughs> just come up. <laughs> so let me just say one of the things that brought me to the rec committee was the concept and the idea that Bill talked about was a, a walkable, bikeable connection between Waterbury Center and uh, downtown. So. Uh, that's why I'm hearing this as well. Stay here, so. <laughs> so I don't. I didn't mind waiting, so we're all good. Um, so thanks for inviting us. Um, I'm representing the Recreation Committee. I'm Frank Spaulding. I'm just a member of the Recreation Committee. I'm representing the committee tonight because of the dual roles of many of our members, including the chair of the committee, who's also on Winterfest. So I was uh, elected, appointed, voluntold to uh, come speak. Um, so we're not going to rehash what happened last year. That's not our goal. What we want to do is report um, the fact that we had a conversation with the Winterfest Committee, have come up with some steps to move forward to have this very energetic volunteer group continue bringing forward a program that's going to be successful for participants in the town and the businesses in the community at large. Um, we've looked at what happened. We've learned from it. And um, we've made a plan to go forward. Our goal is not punitive. Um, we as a committee, uh, by and large, decided that uh, we did not need to be punitive to the Winterfest Committee um, over what happened last winter. We're moving forward. Um, so we've come up with basically two recommendations that were reflected uh, in the uh, committee minutes from 314. And essentially, they are uh, to come up to uh, task the Winterfest Committee and a member of our committee to come up with a uh, a service level agreement between the Winterfest Committee and the town and participants to guide behavior going forward. The other part that we asked them to come up with was to look into the, con the issue of insurance. Right now the town's carrying insurance on this group and we tasked them to look into the concept of getting their own insurance. Um, in the spirit of full disclosure, the committee, the, the Winterfest folks and the member of the rec committee that was tasked to work with them on that have gotten together. And they're of the feeling at this point in time that the service level agreement might be too um, heavy um, in terms of, of a way to go and are moving more towards uh, their thinking. So this is not an official report, but they're, they're considering more of a guidance document that would be would would really lay out the behavior of the participants and the volunteers at the events and it would be a uh, guidance manual that would be, be be shared with the people that are putting on events and the volunteers that are staffing them to make sure that what took place last winter doesn't take place again and the insurance investigation is still ongoing 
So that's where we're at right now. We'd be glad to take any questions you have. Um, I can't speak for the committee because um, once we get together again, we'll talk about that. But um, if you have any questions, I'll answer to the best of my ability. Um, is there any plan for any type of restructuring um, for Winifest, or do you think you've got a platform that, uh, as far as different events or timing or any of those types of uh, uh, changes, uh, or, you, or you think you what you timing of the events or themselves, it's restructuring the committee as it's made up. No, no, restructuring the the events themselves. Are you adding? different things, or are you going to change it up a little bit, uh, uh, timing being um, time of year, you're still looking at that same, I mean, this snow has kind of played against you there. So I'm not a member of Winterfest, Black there today, so I, I, I'm really, I'm not going to speak to what Winterfest is, is deciding. I think uh, our role in the Recreation Committee is to try to um, help them be successful and working, as so we have a, a you know, we have a rec director now, which is great because you know we can represent the interests of the citizens in terms of recreation, and Deb can represent the interests of the town office. Um, and I think together we'll help direct Winterfest to to have a successful event. So I don't think they've gotten to that point yet. I don't want to speak for them, and I won't. But uh, um, I do do know that it was discussed discussed at the uh, meeting that that there was consideration about that moving stuff around. Yeah. Well, Bill's here. He looks like he's anxious to maybe. Um, I'm Will it answer any okay. questions you like? All right. I'll throw the same one at you then. Uh, currently, there's nothing resolved in terms of changing of timing and the schedule of events. Um, what has evolved um, is uh, the way we, this year, um, are dispersing the um, uh, what the monies that were raised is uh, has gone through a pretty exciting change and uh, we'd be happy to come and talk about the grant program that we created and the process that we went through and how we've been dispersing those um, but what's relevant to your question is and what's relevant to this issue is that part of that process encourages those people requesting grants to provide something to Winterfest so there's a good chance we'll have a, a kind of a new generation of people coming on board, leading some events, maybe some new events, maybe taking over some of the other events. So the timing of this requirement to have this guidance document uh, as Winterfest is kind of growing is, is really fortuitous. And so it's, uh, it, it's good that we're going to be kind of forced to get these guidance regulations in front of all these new people who may not remember what we did last year or have a reference or et cetera. So, um, as far as the specifics of changing some of the timing of events, we're not at that point yet. But to your point, there are more people uh, who are going to be more involved with different events, and there's that much more need to have this kind of a guidance document. Can I say something? I think one of the things that, is, as I hear you um, talk about getting your own insurance, the liability is one thing, but the worst thing that can probably happen for Winterfest is if something were to happen and it basically ends, probably ends Winterfest depending on the, the level of what the offense or injury or whatever it is. So I think uh, it's important as you guys grow and I think it's great to see the growth of Winterfest from year to year is there are ways to bring alcohol into an event that's legal and safe and there are outside parties like myself that have been involved in Winterfest and I was this weekend involved in the gravel grinder um, that we, we work with alcohol on a daily basis and we know the rules of Vermont and we take alcohol very seriously and I think that there are plenty of people in the community that have similar um, licenses like I have that can, can help you guys if you want to include alcohol in certain adult events. So I think that's an important part of, as you guys move forward too, because the worst thing I, I, that could happen is something happens and then it's done. So, Thank you. I think it's a good wake-up call, and I think it's going to mature the relationship between Winterfest and Red Committee in the town. I also think it's going to mature the Winterfest committee um, quickly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. anybody else? Okay. No, I'm just going to say that I think it's really important to have protocol and. As you said, new people coming in, it's expanding, and new players, and 
So to have some ground rules to be able to pass along is part of maturing the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a really good step. Well, sometimes the best builder of uh, something like this is once in a while having school hard knocks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for coming in. I have one more thing to present. Good luck. Huh? I'll watch it. I have something else to present. Okay. Oh, you'll stay? Yeah. All right. So uh, something else that's come this over the past, um, well, I've now done two, sum two full summers managing the parks and the recreation department. And something that really has come apparent is we don't have, and it kind of actually goes along with Winterfest, we do not have a true recreation department park policy. Um, the very first year I'd be like, you know, where do I find out about where we get bases? And they're like, oh, you talk to Randy. <laughs> okay, what if Randy's not here? <laughs> well, we're not sure. So, and we've, we've run into issues as the, as growth occurs and new presidents come on that don't know the past way. So I believe you forwarded this to them, correct? Yes? The policy, Bill? I sent it to you and you sent it to them? No? <laughs> Bill was going to forward this to you. I will forward it to you afterwards. I have actually taken um, a lot of research and wrote a park policy manual to address all the issues. I uh, shared it with uh, Woody and Celia and then I shared it with all the leaks um, to get feedback, as well as the Recreation Committee. Um, you know, probably they'll be ne needing some tweaks as we go, but it definitely um, just lists guidelines and what we're responsible for, what the, par um, the leaks are responsible for, and so there's not that confusion in it. So. I, I honestly thought Bill was passing it on, so I apologize for that. So I will forward that to you. I don't need to come back. You can read it through and, and then take it upon yourself to see if you want to make it a mandated part of the recreation department. Um, okay. I got to say, Deb, uh, your efforts are going to be sorely missed. Uh, thank you. <laughs> appreciate <laughs> everything you've done. Thank you. Um, I should let you know that. The Red Cross program that you allowed Heather and I to get certified in the first year was, um, I reported, would break even, and it was a profit year the first year. And with the partnership in the Red Cross programs through the spring, um, well, winter and spring with First and Fitness, um, was um, a surplus of we profited about four thousand dollars off those programs that we're able to filter into our programs that aren't as um, that are just barely breaking even. So, um, thank you on that one too. All right, that's thank it. Thank you very much for your way um, oh, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Absolutely, very much appreciate it. I'll forward this to you guys tomorrow so that you have it um, and can read through it. But like I said, it obviously a bit of a need tweaks, but um, the main players that are involved in this type of thing have read it and, and support it. All righty. Uh, it's about 8.22 and uh, the Rotary Club is up next. Not quite Ind Independence Day Festival. Good evening. I'm Harry Shepard, and um, we're here this evening to ask permission uh, for uh, our special event, moving the NQID uh, back into the village this year. Uh, a little, little description of some changes that we're uh, proposing, and. Um, uh, I think we're seeking a special event permit to uh, hold this. Um, it'll be on in Rusty Parker Park, uh, but we also are working with the state, um, and uh, we are planning to use the state property for uh, some kids' events within the horseshoe, uh, and then fireworks in the evening. Um, and I think that that's uh, going to be accepted. Uh, what we're hoping to do at Rusty Parker Park is a festival for one day on June the 30th. Uh, we're proposing to move the start time of the parade uh, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we're hoping to 
uh, you know, kind of have some continuity with all the people that come into town uh, for the parade uh, to, to roll into the festival that we'll hold at Rusty Parker Park. Uh, we're going to have a couple of bands uh, and a beer garden. Uh, we've applied for a festival permit, and I think that that's being processed through the state at this point. Um, uh, we would like to have uh, custody of the parking spaces around the perimeter of the park. Uh, we're, we're a little concerned that it's kind of tight for the size of the event, uh, and we would, we're thinking of setting up our vendors um, on the parking spaces around the perimeter of the park. Uh, and Rotary Way, um, we're trying to see if we could work something with the antique car show folks to possibly have some of the antique cars over uh, on that side. And then on Main Street in the morning, we're thinking about trying to have the, uh, the bleachers and kind of the focal point for the parade right at Rusty Parker Park in front of the monuments uh, and working with Randy and hopefully get her permission to use her porch. In the past, it was like over at Arvad's. We're kind of trying to think of moving the, um, uh, the, the central area for the parade and you know, the, the um, grandstand area. Um, and we might use the town's grandstand facing the parade and then pick them up and kind of move them to the opposite side of the monuments and, and get them incorporated into the festival after the parade goes by. Um, that's generally what, what our ask is. And, you know, if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to. So the parade takes place at 4 o'clock? Yeah. Think? Okay. Uh, these special events, I mean, what's the kind of the kickoff? Uh, timeline for um, yeah for the particular we're thinking of setting up uh, Saturday morning um, uh, and then starting uh, festival activities before the parade uh, around two okay uh, and then uh, hold that festival through fireworks uh, nine thirty ish uh, so it'll be it'll, it'll be wrapped up by ten. Uh, we've had discussions with um, uh, the property owner that's concerned about noise down there across the street, uh, and she's on board. Um, and we've made it clear that we're going to hold the event through to 10, the music will go through to 10. Um, so it's a little different than a typical Thursday night where we typically shut down the music around 8.30. Um, and, uh, uh, so what time would the music start? The music's going to start right after the parade. We'll probably have um, uh, not a live band. We'll have you know other music going on starting at two o'clock, but not a live band. Live bands will start after the parade. So is the there? The garden is in Rusty Parker Park as well. Yeah, yeah, in the corner where the plaza area is, is where we're proposing to set up the beer garden. So that's the critical element that the town has involvement in. The Rusty Parker Park is owned by the village. You you already attended a village trustees yeah. meeting. The trustees have allowed use of the park for the event. Yeah. Um, it's kind of odd The you know, it's June 30th. That's the last day the village really is going to be in existence as the village. So the parking on the street, I'll take care of that with you. Uh, you know, it's the village still has the ordinance for parking on June 30th. If it was on July 1st, it would not be the village. <laughs> but uh, so the village has allowed the use of the park and allowed the use the uh, the beer garden on the park, subject to the license that they need from the town, right? I think it's in process. Right. Um, and then I think the rest of the events, if you will, uh, and even if this were next year, the village still owns the park. So you'll, you'll have to talk with them about it. But I think that um, the fireworks are going to be here, right? Behind the yeah. city complex. Yeah. And you're going to be, you may have said it already, uh, the state is allowing some use of the horseshoe as they well. Are. The law. Yeah. They are. Um, you know, it's a passive use. You know, we're probably going to try to. It won't be any heavy equipment no or vendors, you know, fire um, no um, Ferris wheels. The state um, there might be 
kids related vendors i oh. think there's someone that wants to do face painting that that kind of thing yeah. um but we're not selling those vendor spaces we can't try to raise any funds on the state property um, but there is a couple of vendors who have expressed interest that are more kid oriented and and the horseshoe is what we're thinking about for that so what kind of discussion have you had about uh, uh, fear of lack of attendance because it's later in the day than normally? Uh, I think um, most of the most of the people that we've talked to think it makes sense. There have been a few that you know have wondered, uh, but change has always comes with that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I guess you won't know until you try. We, right? Yeah, we, we we have experienced in the last few years where there's there's a lull. You know, the parade breaks up. There's a there's a good mass of of participants down in the village. Uh, then when we were out far field, you know, it was really hard to draw them, draw them back. Uh, so, you know, this is one of the things we're going to try to see if we can keep everybody engaged from, you know, when they come downtown to the village for for the parade, and and then hopefully, you know, roll right into the festival and enjoy the event. Yeah. What's uh that makes downtown impassable from basically four to five. Is that is it about an hour? Uh, it's actually a little longer than that. When you know we're going to set up like we did in the past around the state um, drives. This you know the the outer horseshoe in the state complex. Um, but um, uh, I, I think in, you know in reality there's a pretty uh, a lot of visitors, a lot of pedestrians I um, the road closure uh, we used to have the village police help us uh, you know like, I think it was like 15 minutes or so before the parade after actually kicked off and it I think it was more than an hour um, this year actually like pardon it was at 10:30. Main Street. About half an hour before the previous Ten, start half time. an hour I, I think it was more than like two hours that it was actually closed um, and this year we're trying to arrange for Washington County Sheriffs to, to help with providing some blue lights for that. Yeah, I guess my big concern would be just um, the, the amount of traffic on June 30th at 4 versus 11. I just feel like I don't know what happens. What happens when people are parked on that road and then the parade happens? So say, I mean, for example, they go into my restaurant and they don't know there's a parade about to happen. Is their car trapped there for two hours? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just feel a little concerned in how that transition works. I think before it was kind of like the downtown hasn't really turned on and people haven't really parked there yet. But in this scenario, it's halfway through the business day for anyone who opens for lunch ongoing and then customers potentially are don't know it's coming and I mean I guess there could be warning signs that the road would be shut down but then that makes them maybe not want to even park or stay in the area I don't know it just seems like it might work against the businesses even though I think the idea was to make it work for the businesses I also somebody mentioned too that and I agree that change is fine and it's always worth trying but um, someone else mentioned that they tend to always use the, the break to have family barbecues and so now they have to kind of figure out their game plan, but I just told them to do their barbecue first, so. <laughs> um, no, that, but yeah, I, I'm a little concerned about how that's going to work with the businesses downtown. Hmm. Well, that was my question, I guess, for you, Harry, is that, uh, you know, I'm just curious to know how people feel about, I won't say waiting around till 2 o'clock to actually go to an event, um, being the fact that past, uh, they're so kind of used to um, the, what's been the norm for so many years, but again, it's one of those deals where you don't know if you if you try uh, until you try. So I'm not saying that it's a bad idea. I just I wish you the best of luck with that. Um, uh, and to Mark's point, I understand his concerns. Um, <laughs> I guess just signs on this in that main where side parking areas of just warning people that they might get trapped that they're from out of town i think people in town will know but there's definitely a lot of tourism on june 30th that we kind of have to think about 
But you'll have to put a little note in their menu when they get it. That'd be a lot there for a couple hours. <laughs> 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 they get trapped, they have to come back and get another round. Yeah, sure. There you go. <laughs> Is the Green Mountain Mile still happening? To start off the parade? Uh, I believe it is. Because that's usually a fairly good deterrent for parking mm -hmm. with all those people around there. That's true. Everyone's leaving. Yeah, we <laughs> end at Dad Road. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so do we need to make a motion for this bill to the change of kind of? No, I don't think you need to make a motion for that. I think Harry's here to inform you. Um, I think you could make a motion now to authorize the beer garden and then direct staff to make sure that the proper permits are in place. If you want to do that, you can do that tonight. Is there going to be a tent? Um, not big. So rain would really ruin any kind of income for you guys. Right. Um, no, we had the festival then. permit approved by the select board last month. Trustees? Um, both, actually. Okay. Yeah. We'll still have to sign off on that anyway, right? The festival permit? Yeah. The liquor license permit. Yeah, that required my, your approval, my signature. And yeah, typically they can just go right through Carla. Right. Right. Not, yeah, so not that tight, but others. Oh, okay. it, it has my signature block, but I get select board approval. <laughs> Did we do that? Yeah. Remember okay. we had a meeting. There was a special meeting oh, a month or so ago. Oh, right. in the morning? Yeah. 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 So that's already off to DLC. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That sounds like we're all set. Yeah. So I'm going to try to do some temporary signage along Main Street, I think is what I heard. I think it would be just helpful, especially the first year, just to create awareness. But I just don't know how you... Where before, I don't think there was anyone really in town because there really aren't any breakfast spots downtown, so no one's really parked in, inside. Yeah. I think some people are going to caught off guard when all of a sudden a parade starts happening and yeah. they're parked and already inside these businesses, and then they come out and they, maybe some would be really excited, but others might be really upset. So I guess outreach to all the businesses in the area, too. Okay. We'll yeah, I mean, we'll do the best we can, and, and I'll talk to RW and maybe Alyssa can. I was going to say that. I'll put... Yeah, I mean, you guys agree to us then. Touch with yeah, Barry. I think that would be a good idea. And, and we can put up a bunch of signs that say, warning, like if you're parked. And it would be helpful to understand. I, I guess i got to think through where you can and can't park, where maybe we can make suggestions that people, if they walk up to the business, can go move their car real quick or something. If, if they do have another scheduled thing they need to be at, that they don't want to stick around for the parade. Mm -hmm. So if they're in the bank parking lot, they have an escape. Right, but yeah, but I don't even know what's happening with that. By then, there might be gates there. <laughs> but I mean, it, behind the old Ocha building, I think you'd be trapped probably for, for the parade period. Um, but even any of that street parking. I feel like there's typically not a lot of cars anywhere, is it? Well, the past was that, were you allowed to park on, you were allowed to park, so if your car was there, but I don't remember seeing many cars in the past on. People would come street. down and park their car to save Protect. their spot, put yeah. yeah, their lawn chairs out, lawn chairs and out. Lawn chairs in their pickup truck. Yeah. And, and you were talking about trying to have a certain section of yeah, the street. Yeah, we've known that. We've in the past wondered about whether or not we could uh, not have parking on Bank Hill um, when the, like the ceremonies were kind of set up in Arvad's um, porch. Um, there, we, we have in the past wondered about whether or not we could like hold this parade without parking on Main Street. Um, I know that that might be hard to accomplish, but... It works better for the mornings, I think, than the afternoon. Yeah. yeah it's, but you, you moved the review thing to Rusty Parker for this? We have. Year. We have. There'll be bleachers there, and that will be where the... That is the intent, right in front of the memorial. Um, I'll put the bleachers there, and the review stand is going to be on Randy's porch. By 11 o'clock the night before of NQID, Main Street is pretty much filled up with either cars or lawn chairs with ropes or yellow ribbon from down here past the library all the way down to Main Street. Yeah. It's going to be different this year. We'll see how it goes. Well, that's what you, when you brought up the fact that. At times, man, and it differs a little bit from 
from marriage last week, which I'm not sure if you don't want to be right or wrong. Uh, it's been a custom for people, including myself, to bring my truck up or a car up in the evening. Oh, yeah. yeah the night before. <laughs> I didn't even realize that was happening. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sneaky. Same, if the same place, uh, same thing takes place again, uh, and they show up at the same time they normally do, they're going to be deeply disappointed. A long way. <laughs> I'd like to enforce the two-hour parking rule. Yeah. 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 There, there are cars and trucks parked along Main Street starting at six o'clock in the morning. Oh, this is making me house now. I don't want to support it if they're going to squat <laughs> all day in the parking spaces so they can put their chairs up in the afternoon. The business is still treat, trying to eat a workout. You know. <laughs> It'll be a good after action review. Well, I was going to say, you know, yeah. uh, move forward with it, get through it, and uh, people will adjust like they always do, and uh, they'll they'll learn from it uh, well, what to do and what not to do. I I I do like the the prospect of making it uh, more family friendly and trying to bring it back into the center yeah. of the community. Yeah. Um, I and. It comes with challenges, yes. but uh, uh, glad to see that you're willing to take it on. We are. Yeah, I also like the idea of using the horseshoe for some of the Yeah, we were, we, we were working with the state building and grounds folks for a while on trying to get them to, to do it. We have to respect, do it respectfully. We, you know, it's not going to be a Ferris wheel or anything that's going to dig up the yard and hopefully no rain. <laughs> um, so, okay. and we're hoping to get other businesses throughout town involved with taking a piece of it, you know, you know a bounce house or, w or whatever, so. Yep. Sounds like fun, Harry. Okay. What, what are your plans for porta potties whatever? We're going to get some uh, porta potties that we're going to add over in Rusty Parker Park near the, near the pump house. Because in the past, the Leaf People's Half Marathon in October, there's usually a pretty significant line of... Yeah. Of, uh, yeah, we're not going to get that many. But we are, we are getting some other temporary facilities at the pump house. They can put them on your lawn there if you <laughs> if you would let them. Right? Yeah, right. After the construction, we'll make it a <laughs> Thank Good you. Good enough, Eric. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> okay, Bill, it's your turn. Back to the traffic ordinance. I do want to mention first there, we're going to have to, we had kind of scheduled your update here. That got yeah, it, kind it of makes more sense to by, push so. it down in a smaller audience. Yeah. <laughs> State police start at midnight, right, as well, potentially? Uh, yeah. Ah, everything changes at midnight on yeah. the 30th. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we hope. Okay, um, as I talked about briefly at the start of the meeting, uh, the traffic ordinance that I emailed to you on Friday uh, is not the one that's before you today. All of the important elements, what the speed limits are, <clears throat> in what locations they are, where the stop signs are, all that was in what I sent you on Friday. So if you look that over, uh, this one has some changes. Uh, mainly editorial changes. Every place the old ordinance said police officer, it now says enforcement officer. Uh, there's definitions of enforcement officers included in here that includes state police, county sheriffs, constables. They're all defined by state statute, so it just kind of takes advantage of, you know, just taking that lump of people that are allowed to uh, enforce this ordinance. Uh, the penalty section is changed from what you saw on Friday. It's not changed from what we looked at last fall. And that was the only one that wasn't here last year. But um, if you look on pages uh, 32 and following, it talks about waiver penalties. So any, any reference that you may have seen, if you read it on Friday, to jury trials and, yeah. and things like that are, are gone now. Uh, uh, it, in essence, uh, all of the moving violations and speed limits will be adjudicated under the state's, uh, you know, Title 23 traffic laws. 
uh, and people will pay their fines to the Judicial Bureau. Parking, right now, even though this ordinance uh, includes parking uh, time limits, the state police has informed us that they're not going to be writing parking tickets. So if we wanted to enforce parking, we would have to hire the county sheriff, or we could hire, for lack of a better term, you know, civilian uh, tire chalkers or whatever. We don't have meters to read, but um, so anyway, um, the the essence of this is what I sent out the other day. Um, if you want to include uh, the stop signs that we discussed at the intersection of Guptill Road, uh, Maple Street, and I guess, is it Hollow Road all the way over in front of where TJ's was? It, the, or is that no, Guptill? That's, that's Guptill Road. Guptill goes to Howard and, right. and Hollow is right. that. But, so um, the, the only thing with that bill, and, and, and the reason I would like to just go there and see it, I'd, I'm familiar with the area too, but I'd rather have that good, yeah. clear sense before we say plant a couple right. of signs here. So if you, if you don't want to include those stop signs now just because you want to look at it, I don't think it's all that problematic. Um, from the date that you adopt an ordinance, at, uh, it's the 61st day after you adopt the ordinance when it becomes enforceable. So this ordinance will be enforceable in full, like on July 7th. But the existing town ordinance that already has a speed limit on Guptill Road, Maple Street, and Neyland Flats, that is is will be in, is enforceable now and will still be in effect until this goes in effect. So. Uh, if you're uncertain, I would recommend that you adopt this. Um, if you adopt it, I will have to uh, work with Carla to get a summary of this published in the library record um, and then inform the public that they have, I believe they have 44 days in which to uh, petition a special town meeting to overturn this ordinance if people don't want it. If it gets past 44 days, then there can't be a petition to uh, set it aside, but it still doesn't go in effect for another 20 days after that, you know, 15 days after that. Um, and if you decide next month that you want to include those stop signs at Maple Street and uh, Guptill Road, you can amend this ordinance and then it will be 60 days from the date of the amendment that that can be done. So it's a living document. You can amend it at will, basically. Well, there again, to my point, I mean, maybe these flashing speed limit traffic flowing signs may prevent the need for these additional signs. But it'll, no, um, it's just it'll, it'll help. Uh, certainly. Uh, it, uh, it, it's just a good visual and a good reminder, and most folks are pretty conscientious about that. You still have those that don't care, but I think Stowe Street, uh, there's been a reasonable adjustment in driving behavior with that. Yeah, I think so. Um, so I think um, that's start, but it may be that in looking at that and we consider the other options that we may want to consider doing that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So it makes sense. Um, so if somebody wants to uh, make a motion to adopt a new ordinance, paying motor vehicle and traffic. Make a motion ordinance. to adopt the new ordinance for um, regulating motor vehicles and traffic. Okay. I'll second that. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion, Mark Fryer? <laughs> you look like you had you uh, had something you wanted. To no, say. I was gonna. I was gonna second. Oh, <laughs> not fast enough. All right, I, I step back. Okay. <laughs> so, seeing there's no further discussions, all those approve. Say aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Um, what about what about these? Are we do we have to approve these? Um, yeah, I think it would be appropriate here uh, to 
make a motion to authorize me to sign that agreement. So moved. <laughs> I'll second that. It's the finance and maintenance. All those in favor of the finance and maintenance agreement? Say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, if, if I can interject and just give everybody the update as to yeah, sure. what, I, what I know right at this point. Um, uh, some folks know, but uh, others don't. There's yet another transition taking place at the Middlesex station. The uh, station commander that came on board a couple of months ago, he's going to be leaving. And uh, they, they haven't selected a new replacement yet, but when they do, um, we, we should be in pretty good stead. Um, they uh, have identified the two troopers that they'll oh, be assigning. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I can't share names at this point, but they, they opened it uh, uh, across the state for interest. They had three troopers that were all interested in doing it. They selected two out of the three. And um, one uh, uh, is very comfortable working the day shift. The other one's very comfortable working the night shift that suits their living situations appropriately. So uh, we're lined up with that. Um, Bill, uh, Bill and I had some paperwork from the state police, some pro preliminary language on the contract. And we're, we're still working back and forth on refining that. They found out that they, they have to go through a more formalized process for requesting the positions, which is not a big surprise. It's also part of why we were, uh, we're moving ahead the, the way we did. So uh, they've got language that is being submitted on that, requesting uh, the limited service positions that would be these two trooper slots for, for us. So um, timing-wise, we're looking like the uh, July startup should work well. Um, Who has to approve that? Is it legislature that yeah. has to approve that, or yeah. Yeah. joint fiscal committee? Or well, it it, uh, it is funneling through the administration. The uh, secretary of administration is usually the one that has the approval on on those positions. So that's and they've got a, a new standardized form that uh, check the block and fill in the blank kind of thing and. and uh, uh, so the language that you saw, I provided revised language because some of it was uh, not entirely accurate. So <laughs> um, we're, we're in better shape with that. Uh, Lieutenant Letourneau was um, on, the, on the verge of reaching out to us to have discussion over uh, location for a, uh, a local office for the troopers and also having the preliminary discussion on kind of like the, uh, the rules of, of activity. And, and this uh, ordinance piece is an important piece for us with respect to that, because as long as we've got a properly adopted ordinance in place, the ability for them to utilize this for writing uh, traffic violations in the town is, is there. Without proper ordinances, they, they wouldn't be able to do that. And when you look at the ordinances as they're laid out, they mirror the state statute, uh, their, their motor vehicle law. So um, troopers, for the most part, write uh, under state statutes for their violations. But if there's a, a properly enacted ordinance in place, they're able to do that. And that would be a, be a working discussion that we would, we would have with, uh, with those folks and what we're looking to do. Um, uh, from what the lieutenant said, the, uh, uh, both candidates are really excited about the prospect of, of doing this. And um, they specifically, when they were doing the interview uh, process, they were looking for folks that had a, a good community-oriented policing perspective on stuff. And these troopers are experienced um, uh, officers and I, I think it's going to be a, a good fit for us. And they're looking forward to being able to make those community connections that, uh, generally speaking, in the, in the world of working out of a station and servicing multiple communities, you don't get the chance to have that level of connection. But I think they will here. Is there any risk that this doesn't get approved? And do we need to be thinking about that at all? 
I don't think so. Uh, I, I think it will move along. It's just dealing with the bureaucratic process at this point. Uh, the strong part, and again, it goes back to uh, us taking the positive steps about getting that early approval and everything else. We, we've certainly demonstrated our commitment to sustain uh, that process. And we've tried to, some of the language that I suggested uh, for that form was just articulating what the, what the workload and what the benefit uh, would be to the state and to the community by, by having these additional positions. And these assignments that they're getting, is that a year or is that for the length of the contract and then what happens to them? They were, looking, the they were looking for at least a year commitment um, with one of the candidates. Um, he is scheduled to retire earlier than that, um, but uh, I think having somebody with that level of experience and that orientation, once this project is moving along, I, I think it will uh, serve to sell itself among the others. Because people become troopers because they don't want to work in just one set community. They, they want to be able to have the variety and the challenges and the like. And so when the advertisement goes out, you invariably get the ones who, why would I want to do that? I don't want to be stuck in a single community. If I wanted to do that, I would have become a local officer. Um, but others with a broader range of experience um, can see the level of impact that they can have in a given community like that. So uh, two things in our favor. We've got experienced officers that are going to be coming in, but we also have people that want to be doing this type of work. Yeah, I was aware of the fact that one of them was close to retirement there and, and uh, wasn't sure whether I should have mentioned that. Uh, but you did for me, so uh, uh, just curious to know how that, but you kind of explained it, how that transition might take place with with um, the fact that he might, this particular trooper might not be around uh, and how the next one would mold into his shoes. Yeah. You know, they, uh, when, we, uh, when Bill and I met with the um, uh, command staff, the uh, discussion was, um, around time commitments and everything. And uh, they, they basically um, uh, had to come from the position of um, uh, going with a year commitment, uh, because trying to make that longer commitment was more difficult. But uh, knowing that they have that year, and if somebody's not working out for us, or it's not working out for them, then they have the lead time to, to be able to make that replacement. The um, uh, the third candidate, um, the, the reason for the non-selection was the, the trooper recently was assigned with a canine and the, the station where that trooper was coming from had made the sacrifice of getting the trooper through their, uh, all their training and everything else and being down and staffing and uh, they, they just felt uh, to be fair to that home station, they, they didn't want to take that person right at that point in time, but six months or so down the road, it may be a different story. Mm -hmm. Bill, what's going to be the process since we've, we haven't really fielded these kind of concerns because it was sitting with the, uh, the trustees, but as I'm sure we're going to start to get community members asking us for certain things like speed enforcement in certain areas, what's going what's to be the best process or what, how did it work with the trustees or how, how do you envision how that will work if someone or multiple people request a specific action of the state police do i bring it to the select board will it be an, an item on a on our weekly meetings or like where when, when does that happen that we discuss it and then does it go through you and then it goes to them or are we expected yeah. to have someone here so, to represent them so by and large my suggestion would be if particular board members get members of the public asking questions, expressing concerns, asking for particular uh, service, you know, if these folks contacted you and, and expressed a concern about what's happening on Guptill Road in the center, I think it's best if you contact me and then I would have the contact with the lieutenant at Middlesex express what the concern is and then, you know, they would field it and they would process it. But through doesn't need to go through like a their meeting? Normal system. Okay. No. Um, if, if, if the request that you made to me was something that I felt was 
somehow, you know, a, a broader discussion thing, I would say, well, I think maybe we ought to put that on an agenda and talk to the select board about it. If I talked to the station commander and, and he wasn't receptive to my concerns and I don't expect that they would blow me off, but if, if they just kind of ignored it, I would bring that back to the select board and report that here so that we could bring a, a little bit higher level of concern from the community to the station commander. Uh, but I think that from the one meeting that uh, Mark and I had with the key players all the way up to the colonel, um, you know, they want this to work, I think, as much as we do. And uh, I think they're going to be very, they're going to have their radar out to try to uh, meet the community's expectations with certain limitations that were pretty clear. We're not going to, you know, write parking tickets. We're not going to probably be answering every barking dog complaint kind of thing. But uh, regular policing public safety concerns, whether it be traffic or uh, noisy neighbors or what have you, uh, you know, they'll be involved. Can you, can you, I mean, I, I know, Mark, you talked about this when we initially went into the contract, but what is the reasoning that they wouldn't take that on? Are they doing other activities or they just feel that it's not part of? Take what on? The park? Like parking, for example. Like I just, I'm wondering why something like that is considered kind of off the table. There are uh, just so many other things that um, will draw the resource away um, and you know the the instance that you you had here before with multiple people in a local department and utilized uh, part-time folks um, and you can supplement with that with this we'd be using a resource that um, uh, would just be woefully underutilized for doing something like that um, so you think I, they'll have plenty enough other stuff to do? Well, I think so, because... Um, I just want to make sure that it wasn't well, more like... Well, no, they just felt like it wasn't yeah. anything they could well, ever do. Well, one well, they're, 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 of the difficulties, and, and I don't think that they would do it even if we had parking meters, but one of the difficulties of enforcing the parking ordinance that we have is that it's not, it's not timed. Yeah. So what you have to do is you have to walk through a section of the community determine which cars are where, make notations, chalk tires or whatever, and then you gotta come back two hours later or half an hour later or 15 minutes later and do it. If you had meters and you could just walk up and well, it's the red violation sign is up, you write a ticket and you move on. They probably still wouldn't be doing that. And my guess is, I'm not a law enforcement person, but my guess is that, you know, if troopers are kind of saying, well, why would I want to do that job? If I wanted that, I'd be on a local police force. I think more of them would probably say, do I really want to write parking tickets? And yeah, so I, I just don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, I just we can address that like differently. A little while back, there were, I think maybe it was WDEV workers or pit parking for the entire day. I mean, some, some of that kind of stuff, I feel like potentially is Blue Stone calls in and says, this car's here all day, that yeah. like, can they address that or they literally just won't? Yeah, you know, unfortunately for me, Mark, uh, that, that your comments and your concerns, even though to some degree valid, I mean, makes the hair stand on the back of my neck because I, I think to myself, you know, when is it that, when, when is the time gonna come when uh, adults become responsible for some of their, ridiculous actions and it's it's unfortunate that we have to well we can't even hire a, uh, a animal control officer because nobody wants the job to deal with people's dogs and their idiocy uh, it's just it's re I would never be that disrespectful to my neighbors. I just wouldn't. I, maybe I was raised the wrong way, but you know, it's, it's, I, I get really frustrated when I think about how people act towards other people and it, it, it eats me up sometimes to think that we have to hire people to patrol people when, they, when it comes to situations as, as idiotic as 
you know, overstaying your parking because you just don't care what whether you should be there for more than two hours or not. So, you know? what about like you know, because we you know we just. Stow Street, for example, I, I just quickly looked through it and there's like a no parking here to corner. Like, is that something that they will write a ticket for? Potentially. So they would, they would that, write that kind of... That kind of stuff, it's like the swimming hole problem where everybody parks on both sides of a dirt road and you can't get anybody uh, in and out. <laughs> yeah. um, but those kind of parking problems are, are things that they, they deal with regularly. But the, the other piece of this is and, and the command staff was very supportive of it too, is just the local engagement aspect. The getting to know the business owners, uh, getting in to the schools and, and the like. It's the, uh, their, their willingness to do that sort of stuff. I guess I would, I would prefer to have that level of engagement than having somebody chopping tires on this. Yeah, Anthony was great. He would come into the, the the restaurant and let everyone know that the park, you know, winter parking man's people forget about it. Yeah. And he would come yeah. in and just let the bartenders know, let people know that yeah. they're at midnight, even though we're open until one, that like their cars will start moving. Yep. <laughs> yep. So you, you brought up a good question that just came to mind when you talked about people parking on both sides of the dirt road. So in, in the, uh, under the circumstance that we've had on Guptal Road there near me a few times, um, would they address something? Yeah, yeah, and that so, and that would be something more often than not addressed with the the proprietor at the at the attractive nuisance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah, that 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 sort of thing, and um, you know the uh, the disadvantage we have right now is that we really don't have that sort of presence to head that off before it becomes a problem. Um, with, with what they should be able to have for uh, the freedom of movement within the community, uh, I, I think it's gonna serve all of our needs much better. Well, I certainly hope this works out uh, for the betterment of both the state and us. Because uh, un unlike Mark Fryer, um, I dread the, the, the concept of a Townwide Police Department. It just the expense of it all would would be quite a burden. Um, so if there's no other, why'd you call me out specifically? No, because I know I know you 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 know you you you're kind of in favor of, of uh, seeing that to come to fruition. So I wasn't picking on you or anything. No, I no. felt picked. On. You know, I'll, I'll bring I'll bring you the teddy bear the next time we meet. Everett. Uh, you are aware, I'm sure, if, if you're not material in schools, you probably, but a person being the so-called AKA meter maid does not have to be a law enforcement certified person. And I can't imagine in this community that there isn't someone that either has had some law enforcement connections or maybe a retired police officer from some other city out of Vermont or whatever wouldn't be enjoying going along and writing tickets like at the end of the week. What's the legality of that with them not actually being on a payroll? Yeah. No, no, they, 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 they would have to hire you paid, yeah. right? But, they, but to, that, the, to that point, I mean, the village, the village advertised for somebody to do that job, and there was not one applicant. We advertised in the newspaper, we advertised on the website. Maybe they just didn't want to be affiliated with the village police department. I don't know. Uh, but I was going to mention that, except I felt I could mention that at the next meeting because we've been here a long time. But we, we can talk about other ways to enforce the parking ordinance if you want to. I think what you said, Bill, is, is the reason. That's why we, we dwindled down to having only two offices, because Waterbury Police Department basically was not effective and was somewhat the laughing stock of the entire law enforcement community in the state of Vermont. Okay, people. Um, transportation liaison contract? Yeah, I sent this out uh, on Friday to you. Um, this is the position that Barb Fire is employed with. Um, and uh, we have taken the uh, long-term community recovery director position uh, out of this job description or out of this contract because 
uh, for the most part, all of those issues are tied up and uh, you know completed. Um, so this contract um, actually. We signed it in May last year. Uh, it's retroactive to April 1st. Um, uh, I had it uh, virtually ready before then, and then uh, I had the flu and forgot to bring it to a meeting. So anyway, um, Barb uh, works as an employee of the town under the uh, auspices of this contract. She. Um, this contract for this year is 20 hours a week. Last year it was 23 hours a week. Um, next year it will probably be 25 hours a week with the Main Street project coming into play. The position is um, probably about 80% funded through state uh, uh, cooperative agreement that we have with the state. Uh, she keeps track of the hours that she works as the liaison right now on this Route 100 construction project. She keeps track of the hours that she works uh, gearing up for the Main Street project, and the state reimburses us for all these costs. So uh, I would ask that you authorize this agreement and authorize me to sign it. Runs through, um, I think, <coughs> March 31st next year. So moved. OK. Is there a second? I second. Any further discussion? Um, I'd just like to say that there's there's been people that have approached me uh, or made comments in reference to her position and wondered why we're continuing to have that position filled. And uh, but I think, in all due fairness, uh, I think it's a valid position up through and including the re reconstruction Main Street project. Yeah, these are big, point. These are big projects. Yeah. And Barb, Barb I, I appointed, even when she was working for uh, Armada, when we first had the long-term uh, recovery uh, contracts with them, um, you know, when we got to the point of knowing what we were going to do as far as the building, you know, I delegated her to be the lead person on this, this building project, uh, you know, uh, we have limited staff right now, and this, the cost is really being borne by the state. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, when the Main Street project is completed, uh, I'll never say never, but I would expect that probably the position will phase out at that point. But since it's being paid for by the state, they're willing to pay us to have somebody to get out and to work with the public, to work with uh, you know uh, people in the tourism industry, to field complaints. I mean, the number of emails that she's getting already on this Route 100 project, and it's only a month old. Uh, if somebody else in the office had to be doing that, we wouldn't be getting anything done. I so. think you'd get a lot more if she wasn't already doing the work that yeah. she's been doing. I, so I think. I, it, I think there's real value in having one person who is handling all that and has that. As, the, as these projects, just like this building, getting built in this whole facility, you know, they, they have a good memory of, they put, put it all together, and I think this, that's invaluable. Well, it's one thing, I mean, the emails that are being sent out, not only by her, but uh, Agency of Transportation are kind of redundant, but um, the fact that she's handling the personal phone calls and dealing with the critical situations uh, and a hands-on approach that uh, you're probably not going to get that same service out of uh, the Agency of Transportation. And uh, I got to say uh, one other thing there, dealing, you know, for anybody that's driven up Route 100 here, um, if Barb had been here tonight there, um, we could have maybe had a little discussion about how that whole thing's going. But uh, if, uh, is there any, if that's any indication of how re reconstruction of Main Street's going to happen, going to go, God pity us. Um, it's going to be way worse. Oh, I'm telling you. Yeah. Practice it's going to be uh, uh, a few, <laughs> few years of uh, madness here, but um, we got to get we got to get through it. Reconstruction. <laughs> so a motion's been made and seconded uh, to uh, uh, support the uh, transportation liaison contract. Uh, have Bill sign that. What's that? 
Um, so all those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. And uh, last thing, a letter from Mr. Kilgore. Yeah, so um, if any of you uh, do personal business with Jeff, uh, he's phasing out of his law practice. So this letter came to the town on April 13th, uh, and he's basically saying after 40 years of private practice, the last five and a half, which he's uh, shared serving as the Washington County Probate Judge, uh, he's going to phase out of private practice and devote all his time uh, to serving as, as a judge. So he's not retiring completely, but he's not going to do any more, uh, not going to do very much more work. And um, what he's asking here is that, uh, or he's telling us that he has um, made an arrangement with Stackpole and French, a law firm out of Stowe, and they're going to have an office here in Waterbury where his office is. And his files and his clients will be passed along to this uh, law firm unless we, as clients, decide we don't want to go there. Um, many towns appoint one town attorney. We have, we've never done that in the 30 years that I've been here because there are many attorneys who have better specialties than others and you know we use Stitzel and Page for planning and zoning and land use issues. We use Paul Giuliani for uh, water and sewer if you're in the village for uh, bond council work. Uh, we have used Jeff. Jeff mainly has been kind of, uh, he helped with the roundabout necessity. Um, he started off on the Main Street project and he's done a little bit of odds and ends here and there. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention. My recommendation is that we allow the files that Jeff has to go to Stackpole and French, the firm that he's more or less passing his practice on to. He will be of counsel to that firm, and his um, administrative assistant office manager is moving into that firm as well. So uh, we'll be able to access what we need here. The other option is we pick up the files and then send him off to another attorney, but I think I would trust his judgment as to who he wants to take his business to. So unless you object, we'll just uh, let him know that's fine. No motion necessary. No. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Yeah, I'll bet. Is there a second? I'll second, second that. All those approved? Aye. 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 So check that it doesn't out. have to be the during your meeting, but you might, you might find it interesting to attend the DIB meeting on the 16th.